This episode fueled by mud water. Follow the link in the description to get a crazy deal on your first order of mud. My name is Michael. I've been absolutely fascinated by tabletop role-playing games for the better part of my life, and I am sick of talking about vampires and werewolves. But let's talk about some vampires and werewolves. Welcome to Roll With Me. When we think about Monster of the Week, we think of vampires and werewolves and ghouls and zombies, which are kind of like ghouls, and mummies, which are zombies with cloth on them. And the basic flavors of monsters can get a little tedious and tiring after a while, especially if you're doing a long-running campaign of Monster of the Week. So one of my favorite things that I used to do for my party when I was running our long-form campaign was to research some obscure myths and monsters to help spice up our game uh, that really kept them guessing and made for some really fun, flavorful storytelling. Part of running a great Monster of the Week campaign is keeping your party guessing, really making them solve the mystery and having it really feel like a mystery, something that they really need to work towards to understand and develop their, their angles of attack towards how they're going to solve the problem you lay out for them. And a, a good way to do that is to dive into creatures that they don't know of, things they haven't heard of, or weird, obscure legends that you made up uh, based on real things. Thing. You can do anything. You can literally do anything. So like branching out of the big three of werewolves and vampires and zombies, we can we can really dive into some cool stuff. The full moon is high in the sky. Your monster hunting party receives a call. There's been a wolf attack in the woods outside of town. Okay, let's put two and two together. Grab the silver bullets, say your prayers, and get ready to take down some werewolves. And you get into the woods and you track down the, the creature from the fur and the markings on the trees. And oh, it's a cold autumn's night and you're facing down this creature and all of a sudden you see it in the clearing, in the moonlight a hulking, furry, fanged beast, fearsome and large, covered in blood and fur and matted tufts of bloody fur. And you open fire on it with your silver bullets and it doesn't do shit because it's not a werewolf. It's an Amarok. A gigantic wolf from Inuit mythology said to stalk and devour any person foolish enough to hunt alone at night. Unlike wolves who hunt in packs, Amaroks hunt alone. In the 19th century, Danish geologist and Greenlandic scholar Heinrich Johannes Rink reported that the Greenlandic Inuit hold the word Amarok exclusively for this specific legendary wolf, whereas other Arctic peoples use it to refer to any wolf. So keeping your players guessing on this werewolf game is gonna be super fun because if you have them go on this wild goose chase to collect silver bullets or uh, to make some holy water or something and, and research how to kill a werewolf or figure out how to track and, and, and catch a werewolf or how to turn a werewolf back, right? They're not gonna be suspecting that it is a completely different creature from mythology, this horrifying wolf that in many ways could resemble what a werewolf looks like in werewolf form, but is in fact this horrible god creature from Inuit mythology that does not adhere to the rules of what we know as werewolves. It doesn't listen to silver bullets. It doesn't care about the full moon. It just happens to be a night on the full moon. And now we have to figure out how to deal with an Amarok. And there's not a lot about that that I could find, like how to kill an Amarok, but get creative. I mean, like it's from Inuit mythology, so, so 
dig into Inuit lore and f find things that they find sacred, perhaps some sort of carved bone knife with some certain runes or etchings on it uh, would do the trick, or some legendary weapon that was used in one of the legends of the Amarok, uh, and 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 e extrapolate on that, and and then your your twist, right, is in day one of the mystery they encounter the werewolf but then they have to go on this whole other side plot to figure out what it actually is and how to get it f away from their town and stop attacking you know innocent campers and whatnot and there is nothing i love more than a good twist but it has to be earned there has to be some sort of something happening in town perhaps there is some uh nature ceremony being performed by the local uh, Inuit uh, reservation. Uh, perhaps there is, there's, there's something going on that'll lead to hints uh, that this is an Amarok, that this is not a werewolf, um, instead of, you know, the telltale signs of somebody being bitten, right? The the person who maybe survived an Amarok attack has been bitten but isn't showing any signs of lycanthropy, isn't following the rules of, of what some books in the world might say about werewolves and, and lycanthropy and how that works, you know, figuring it out as we go along that this creature is indeed something entirely separate. Something strange has happened at Jethro Brown's farm. All of the cows in one of his fields appear to have been bled completely dry. Not a sign of blood anywhere in the field. All the cows, nothing but skin, and bones, and meat. And all of the blood is gone. Bone dry. It's chupacabra. It's not a chupacabra. Chupacabras drink the blood of goats. So what is this creature? What is stalking the livestock of Jethro Brown's farm and bleeding the cows dry? I'll tell you. It's a Rakshasa, or if it's female, a Rakshasi. In Hindu mythology, these are a type of demon or goblin. Rakshasas have the power to change their shape at will and appear as animals, monsters, or in the case of female demons, as beautiful women. They are most powerful in the evening, particularly during the dark period of the new moon, but they are dispelled by the rising sun. They especially detest sacrifices and prayer. Most powerful among them is their king, the ten-headed Ravana. Putana, a female demon, is well known for her attempt to kill the infant Krishna by offering him milk from her poisoned breast. She was, however, sucked to death by the god. Not all Rakshasas are equally evil. Some are more akin to Yakshas, nature spirits, while other are similar to Asuras, the traditional opponents of the gods. The term Rakshasa, however, generally applies to those demons who haunt cemeteries, eat the flesh of men, and drink the milk of cows dry, as if by magic. So I guess I probably should have said barren of milk rather than barren of blood. That's fine. Rakshasas are super cool. Uh, they were popularized by Matt Mercer in Critical Role, uh, or repopularized, I should say. I think they've appeared in Supernatural. They've appeared all over the place. Uh, there's a lot of pop culture references to Rakshasas. They're very cool. They're shapeshifters. They can do lots of magical things. Um, and they have lower forms, and these lower forms might just be more feral, kind of monstrous creatures, and they have higher forms that are, that are civilized and intelligent, and uh, become uh, take take the shape of people and walk among people, and are just feeding on the life energy of the people around them. These trickster gods. Uh, so you could have a Rakshasa start out as a mythical feral monster, right? This is your mystery, is to figure out what's bleeding the cows dry, right? And you find out it's a Rakshasa, and you figure out how to defeat a Rakshasa, and then you realize that they travel in packs, and there's a hierarchy to them. They follow a political structure, and that there is someone pulling the strings. 
And if you want an overarching villain for your campaign in Monster of the Week, a Rakshasa is a really cool alternative to the Strahd-style vampire. Equally calculative and intellectual and intelligent, these creatures are very dangerous and very powerful and very clever. So outsmarting them might not be the easiest thing and fighting them directly is not going to be the easiest thing. And that's why this creature can be such a powerful overarching villain, the, the, the big bad evil guy out there in your campaign. Prakshasas are cool and cooler than vampires. Speaking of bloodsuckers, people have been disappearing from town recently. And this morning, you found Jim Bobson drained of all of his blood outside of his house in his backyard. Horrible, gruesome scene. Gotta be vampires. Gotta be. So you grab your holy water and your crosses and your garlic and you get ready for battle. And you say your prayers and you face off against the Kamazots. An ancient, lesser god from Mayan mythology described as an anthropomorphized, leaf-nosed bat. This led to conjecture about the source of the myth. Some believe the ancient peoples based him on the common vampire bat or on Desmodus draculae, a much larger species, both leaf-nosed as well. Both of these species inhabited Mexico in 100 AD when a bat deity was first mentioned in a cult of the Zapotec tribe. The Zapotecs believed ba bats represent night, death, and sacrifice. This was likely due to the fact that bats would inhabit the caves around sacred areas, which the Mesoamericans believed were portals to the underworld. It would be a very chilling sight at dusk when the bats would swarm out of these portals and begin drinking the blood of other animals. The Kemazuts is a vampire on steroids. They are basically the vampires that are in From Dusk Till Dawn, which is a great movie if you haven't seen it. Uh, that kind of horrible bat creature nightmare vampire that is cares a little bit less about turning you into one of their uh, people blood banks and cares more about ripping you limb from limb unless they're just really hungry in case they in that case they just they just want your blood but they're horrible Hor horrible Hor horrifying and horrible new word horrible that is that is what all of my monsters in monster of the week are horrible the Kemazots might have entirely different motivations than a typical vampire would, therefore they are going to be much more difficult to track. They're a completely unique monster uh, that you're going to need to study up on some legend or find an expert or something, watch some documentaries, pour through hours of ancient aliens uh, documentaries. To, to figure out what this thing is and how you can dispose of it because you don't want that around your neighborhood. Maybe you do, I don't. It is unseasonably cold, even for this time of the fall. It is a cold night. And you hear the livestock at Jethro Brown's farm, they're freaking out in their pens and barns and whatnot. And Jethro Brown runs out to see what's going on in this cold winter. And all of his livestock is gone. Man, he's having a bad time in this Monster of the Week campaign. All of his livestock is gone. That, that dude is, I hope he's like government subsidized or something. What kind of creature could do this kind of devastating destruction to this poor farmer's livelihood. What kind of monster could gobble up an entire barn full of goats and pigs and cows in a matter of moments? It's a werewolf. No. It's a ghoul. No. It's the Wendigo, a horrifying nightmare creature from Algonquin folklore. Found in the East Coast forests of Canada, the Great Plains regions of the United States, the Great Lakes regions of the United States, and Canada. It's horrifying. It's terrible. 
The Wendigo is often said to be a malevolent spirit, sometimes depicted as a creature with human-like characteristics which possesses human beings. The Wendigo is known to invoke feelings of insatiable greed and hunger, the desire to cannibalize other humans, as well as the propensity to commit murder in those that fell under its influence. Wendigos are so fucking cool and nobody ever uses them anymore and I don't understand why. Although, when I introduced a Wendigo to my Monster of the Week party, one of my players knew a lot about Wendigos and had just run a Wendigo as a villain in his Pathfinder campaign. So as soon as I labeled the first chapter of the, of the arc about something about hunger, he popped up and said, oh, it's a Wendigo, we're fighting a Wendigo, guys. And he was right. And I didn't find out for like two more weeks. But he was right. Wendigo sickness is super cool. If a Wendigo uh, looks directly at somebody and they don't die, they develop Wendigo sickness and they become a, a cannibal and they need to eat raw meat and, and eat so much food to satisfy their hunger until they transform into a Wendigo themselves. And you can stop this Wendigo sickness by killing the original monster. So holy shit, if a Wendigo like sees a group of campers, Boy Scouts or something out on their winter jamboree and they all come back and they're eating all sorts of crazy shit and everything's weird and they're all getting sick and stuff and then they're like turning into Wendigos and you got a bunch of little cannibal kids running around the town. Holy shit, that would be sick. And if your party keeps figuring out what you're trying to do, and, and they always hit the nail on the head, and it's never a strange or interesting mystery for them. You can always go aliens. You heard what I said. Aliens. Fucking A, right? You can do aliens. You can do all sorts of aliens. You can do humanoid aliens. You can do insectoid aliens. You can do aliens in a gaseous form. You can do alien bugs. You can do, I said that one. You can do alien shrimp. You can do alien monkeys. You can do alien spiders. You can do alien alien aliens. You can do all sorts of aliens. You can do whatever you want and your party will never see it coming because for some reason nobody does aliens. So you can totally do do aliens in Monster of the Week. You can do aliens. It'll be super cool. Just it's fine. You figure out how the aliens work. Your party will never guess it. They'll have to figure it all out and it'll be great. It's the, the one thing they just can't guess other than things that you just make up entirely. But I guess you do aliens. You just make them up. To, I don't know, dude. You happy now? You nerdy. The beauty of Monster of the Week lies in the making of the mystery and the party going down this rabbit hole to understand what is going on in their world and to figure out how to stop it and put an end to it. It makes for a much more fun game when the story is interesting and the story is easily made more interesting by using more obscure and interesting monsters as your villains in the game. Yeah. Well, I hope you found this helpful, um, and uh, let me know what else you guys want to know about Monster of the Week or other tabletop gaming things. Yeah.